Today's show has a theme to it. Public Works mega projects, big multi-billion dollar infrastructure proposals backed by big companies promising to spend big dollars and create big jobs. And sometimes actually, pretty much all the time, the people who don't want these big projects to proceed for whatever reason. I think we need a balance, don't we? I mean, we don't want to be like China or other command and control economies where the government simply orders a project to proceed to hell with any democratic dissent, let alone environmental or safety issues. But we don't want to be like so many jurisdictions in Europe, the United States, and increasingly here in Canada, where the discovery of a, a beetle or some rare dung pile of interest to obscure scientists shuts down the entire local economy and with it, prosperity for people. Is there a happy middle ground? Well, today is the tale of two extremes. Later in the show, we'll interview John Carruthers, the president of the Northern Gateway Pipeline, a project of Enbridge. We've talked about it a dozen times on the show. It would take about 525,000 barrels of oil a day from Alberta to the port city of Kitimat, B.C. Kitimat has been an active port where tankers come and go with various fuel products for decades. They're building another pipeline there right now for natural gas and another tanker facility for liquefied natural gas ships. So it sort of makes sense to use that existing port, doesn't it? Well, that's what Andrews thought back when they first started consulting for the pipeline back in 2008. Yeah, five years ago. They had been consulting four or five years already. The regulatory review panel doesn't even have to give its ruling on the matter until the end of 2013. Construction won't even begin for another year at least. The thing won't be working in the best case scenario until 2017. And that's assuming no lawsuits to slow it down or even violence and civil disobedience from Idle No More or other BC environmental radicals. So from conception to reality, this oil pipeline project will take at minimum 10 years to finish if all goes well. By the way, the Second World War took less than six years to fight. The First World War took about four and a half. Canada fought two world wars in the time it will take us to go from conception to reality with this pipeline. Now, the government has set up a special panel called the Joint Review Panel. Joint because it's joint between the National Energy Board and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, but also because both the federal and the B.C. provincial government agreed that this panel will be the process for both of those governments. But then in a bizarre outburst just last Friday, British Columbia's ruling Liberals said they're opposed to the project. Even though the panel isn't done reviewing it, even though it's their panel too, that's the joint part. This is strange. But no stranger than the government paying for dozens of Aboriginal activists and environmental activists to come to testify against the pipeline. Seriously, millions of tax dollars were spent to whip up dissent to this project, to hire consultants and lawyers for anyone who wanted to come and bitch about pipelines or oil or the capitalist system in general. It was a circus and a gong show. Everyone in the world, literally the world, was invited to come and mouth off against this pipeline. Here's a letter sent by Sitco to the joint review panel opposing the pipeline. Now, Sitco is the state-owned company owned by the authoritarian government of Venezuela. They're a member of OPEC. Seriously, this government process even let foreign competitors have a say. Sorry, that's nuts. Now, pipelines are the safest way to transport any liquid. They just are. Trains are safe too, but not quite as safe. Trucks are safe too, but a little bit less safe. It's all very safe. It's just the pipelines are the very safest. Here's a partial map of existing oil and gas pipelines across North America. As you can see, there is already a pipe going to Kitimat. There's already another pipe going to Vancouver. How do you think those places get their oil? By, by unicorn? The Enbridge pipeline, of course, would be much more modern than some of those other ones. The latest technology, the latest regulations, both of the pipe itself and the tanker facility. By the way, there has never been a navigational incident of a tanker, either in Kitimat or in Vancouver in 50 years. There just, there just hasn't been. Now, compare that to the story I told you yesterday of another energy mega corporation called NextEra out of Florida. It's a $32 billion company with equally ambitious plans for power. Now, unlike Enbridge, which has massive demand for oil at world prices, there is no natural demand for wind power. It's just too unreliable. The government of Ontario has a real-time website that tells you just how unreliable wind power is at any given moment. 
There are about 1,300 megawatts of wind power capacity in Ontario. When I checked this morning, about 15% of that was working. Here's the latest right now, about 20%. So let's put aside the uselessness of wind turbines for now and the monstrous subsidies in the form of jacked up power prices and the fact that 80% of them are down at any time. Let's just talk about how those were approved. As you know, Ontario's Green Energy Act specifically took away the power of local municipalities to control their own zoning and development plans because, of course, no one wants skyscraper-sized wind factories built next to their homes. So all the normal democratic checks and balances were removed, and power was centralized in the government ministry. There were no years and years of public hearings with neutral expert panels where critics were invited to attend and were paid to attend, and their lawyers and environmental and health experts were paid to attend too. Are you kidding? There were no hearings of any sort. Anyone who complained was called a NIMBY, not in my backyard. That's what that stands for. And talk about bullying. Anyone who claimed health effects was told, oh, you're faking it. Seriously, could you imagine a government official telling, say, an Indian band along an oil pipeline to shut up because they're whiners and any alleged health problems were just fakers? That's what Ontario is doing. And imagine just for a moment if instead of spending 10 years consulting with local people as oil pipelines do, if instead they just sued anyone who objected because they said mean things about oil companies. Well, that's what Nexera is doing in the case of a lonely anti-wind turbine protester named Esther Reitman. For the sin of mocking Nexera's name, she calls him Next Terror on her blog, they're suing her in court? Uh, making fun of oil industry names is standard procedure for anti-oil groups. I mean, Look at some of these. I found them in about 10 seconds on the Internet. Could you imagine if Exxon or Shell or BP hired the biggest law firms in the world to sue environmentalists into oblivion just for calling them names? Not only would those oil companies lose in the court of law, but they'd lose in the court of public opinion, too. Nexera, a $32 billion foreign company, is suing little Esther Reitman for making a joke out of their name. I'm not saying it's a funny joke, Next Terror. I'm just saying it's a joke. And jokes are legal. But this isn't about the lawsuit. It's actually about smothering Reitman in legal costs and time costs that she just doesn't have. By coincidence, yesterday, the government of Ontario introduced a bill called Bill 83 that would stop strategic lawsuits like this. It lets judges throw out nuisance suits like this and penalizes bullies. The purpose of this law, and I quote from it, is to discourage the use of litigation as a means of unduly limiting expression on matters of public interest and to reduce the risk that participation by the public in debates on matters of public interest will be hampered by fear of legal action. Yeah, this should be called the Next Era bill, shouldn't it? I wonder if Next Era will come to regret their bullying of Esther Reitman. I wonder. But let me tell you one more story. I've told you about the absurd lengths that oil companies must go through to build basic infrastructure that has been commonplace in North America for a century. And I've told you how wind turbines have been exempted from democratic or environmental or health scrutiny. I mean, compare the criminal charges against Syncrude for some duck deaths a few years ago with the absolute don't give a damn attitude towards countless bird deaths in wind turbine blenders across Ontario. But now let me tell you about a law that our federal parliament passed just a few months ago. It's called the Bridge to Strengthen Trade Act. That's a great name. It was rushed through parliament to approve the new bridge between Windsor, Ontario and Detroit, Michigan. It's a huge project, not as big as Enbridge's pipeline, of course, not as valuable to the economy. And unlike that pipeline, this bridge will be paid for in part by the government of Canada. But there's someone who really, really doesn't want that new bridge. It's the billionaire who owns the current bridge, Matty Maroon. Of course he doesn't want a competitor. He wants a monopoly that he owns. And he has spent millions of dollars in negative ads and lobbying to stop the new bridge. He'll try to stop it at all costs. He's failed so far. So he's like environmentalists against the oil pipeline, sort of. I mean, he hates it. So what did our government do to get that bridge done? Well, they passed a special law especially for this one bridge. Look at Section 2 of this law. It specifically refers only to this bridge being built between Windsor and Detroit. Okay, so what does the law do? Well, you're not going to believe this. According to the law, the Fisheries Act the Navigable Waters Protection Act, the Species at Risk Act, Section 6 of the International Bridges and Tunnels Act, and the Port Authority's Operations Regulations do not apply to the construction of the bridge, parkway, or any related work. I was quoting verbatim from the law there. 
Seriously, this bridge is exempted from all environmental laws or any other regulations. It's just exempted. In advance, here's section 3.2 from the same law. Any authorization that would have been required for its construction, but for subsection 1, is deemed to have been issued. So build the bridge first and then get all the necessary permits for it after the fact automatically. I'm not making this up. This is the law. Here's section 4.1 of the law, subject to subsection 2, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act does not apply to the bridge, parkway, or any related work. So, so no environmental assessments, no hearings, no panels, no delays. Just build it. Fish be damned, birds be damned. It goes on like that for the whole bill. That's all this law is about. My point is the government really wants this bridge. They know it has a deep-pocketed foreign opponent, Manny Maroon. They know he'll sue or lobby to stop it. So they simply are suspending all those rules. So he can't sue to slow down the bridge. No permits needed, no hearings, just build it, guys. Even the Ontario windmills have to get some permits. Could you imagine an oil pipeline being built this way with a special law designed to exempt it from any scrutiny? Of course not, because you see that's Alberta oil. It's not as important as Ontario auto parts that cross the Detroit River every day. Do you think that Justin Trudeau and Thomas Mulcair and the left-wing labor unions that oppose the oil sands would dare to oppose a bridge needed by the auto industry, a.k.a. the Canadian Auto Workers Union? That industry will get its bridge fast-tracked. No political fuss, just that Matty Maroon, and we've got around him. By the way, I don't think that we should build pipelines that way. I think there should be some public hearings. I, I want to make sure pipelines are environmentally sound, and safe. I actually want some hearings. Maybe not 10 years worth. Maybe one year's worth. But that's the problem. In Canada, even under this conservative government, there's a pecking order. You see, the auto industry is untouchable. The wind subsidy industry is almost untouchable. And the oil industry, well, every lawyer and lobbyist and foreign meddler in the world is welcome to gum up that business, aren't they?